We're beginning to get to the end of the requirements for our spiritual journey. As we have progressed during the week, I have been trying to lay out for you the various requirements to make this spiritual journey a really satisfactory and successful one, to know what the things are that are required in order that we can have a happy, glorious, fulfilled journey, which really is our life. And we've talked about understanding who we are, that we are really spiritual beings, that the our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We have talked about the supply that we need in order to continue on this journey. And now we come to another requirement, and that is the requirement of good health. If we aren't strong and well and healthy, we can't have a very satisfactory journey if we're going around the world. And neither can we have a satisfactory journey in our spiritual lives. It's very difficult to really feel that there is a spiritual power and an opportunity to grow and expand if our bodies are really complaining all the time. And I believe that this is one of the reasons that Jesus did so much healing work. I've always said that really he did it to attract attention. And there's no better way to attract attention, is there, than to be a healer. You remember when Catherine Kuhlman was at her height, how the thousands of people used to flock to Philadelphia to be healed by her spiritual intercessions. And the same thing happened to Jesus. When people found out that he had the ability to heal them, they came from miles and miles around in order to have that physical healing. Once you feel well, you can do almost anything. And so Jesus healed everybody who came to him, who had the desire to be healed, and who had the faith that he could really heal them. And the one thing that he required of them was the belief. You remember he said in, many times in the scripture, he could not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. And I want to read to you just a little bit of the Gospel of Matthew where he describes, where it describes the way in which different people came for healing. This is from the ninth chapter. And while he was speaking to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, and come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. Can you imagine having that kind of faith to ask Jesus to raise your daughter from the dead? And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a hemorrhage for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, If I only touch his garment, I shall be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her said, Take heart, my daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a tumult, he said, Depart, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went through all that district. And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. And when he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. And then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly charged them, See that no one knows it, 
but they went away and spread his fame through all the districts. He required of every one of them belief that he could do this. And the same thing is required of us today. If we are going to experience the kind of health that Jesus plans for every single one of us. We are so likely to accept the doctor's diagnosis or the idea that whatever it is you have that the doctor says, and then that's the way it's going to be. How many times we hear people saying, well, I've got this, that, or the other, and you know what that means. I can't eat this these things and I have only a certain length of time and I can't walk and I'm going to have this pain and all of these other conditions that come along when we're given a diagnosis. Instead of recognizing that our bodies are spiritual bodies, even our scientists will agree with this when they say we're made up of a few ounces of water, a few uh, chemicals, and a few electrical charges. And when you think of that, when you picture yourself as ephemeral as that, held together with a few char electrical charges and a lot of water and uh, some chemicals, what is there that can be so solid that nothing can change? Could it be that this is because we see ourselves this way, that we cannot accept the kind of healing that Jesus planned for every single one of us? We have become so earthbound by our beliefs and by our thoughts and by the consciousness that's around us that it's very difficult for us to see how there can be any kind of change in this body which is so solid and which we accept as being solid and in such a particular state that nothing can change it. And so when we read these pictures, we, these accounts of the way in which Jesus healed people, do we say, yes, he can do that today because he did it 2,000 years ago? Or do we say, well, things are different today, you know, we don't have that kind of healing anymore. So we have to make up our minds as to whether we're going to accept the world's opinion, the world's diagnosis, or whether we are going to follow the teachings of Jesus and allow that spiritual power to manifest itself in our body. I just love Joe's uh, Joe, Joe story this morning of the coach. Didn't you think that was exciting? I thought it was just beautiful. And to think of ourselves as a coach and the coachman. We're the coachman. And inside that coach is the divine Christ the I of our being, whatever way you can relate to it. I always think to, to think of it as the I is just so wonderful because then we can identify with every time that Jesus said I in the scripture. So many wonderful promises are there. And because we have not recognized that that same power is the I of us, the big capital I, not the coachman up here with the little I, but the big capital I inside, that we do not have those same qualities that he says we have. And so we allow the coachman to take us wherever he wants to go. Have you ever gotten into a taxi and told the taxi driver where you want to go and you think it's probably a mile and the next thing you know he's driven 10 miles around? Because he didn't know where he was going. And this is what happens to us if we want to use that same uh, metaphor of the coach and the coachman and the Christ within us, that we just take off and let the horses take us wherever we want to go instead of taking control and listening to what the passenger, which is the I within us, is telling us to do. And once we listen and take the direction, then we really have a goal and we can apply all of those promises all of those teachings that Jesus gave us to us, every single one. I am come that you might have life more abundantly. I do what the Father tells me to do. 
It is the Father within me that doeth the works, and the things that I do shall you do also. When we recognize that this power within us is that same power, then we can begin to really trust and put it into practice. And one way we do this, of course, is to use little illustrations. I suppose every one of you, I hope every one of you has had a kind of a miraculous healing of a cold. That's, not, that's a very simple thing to have happen. And uh, if you get to the place of saying, look, there's a power within me that is not going to let any of that stuff bother me. I am going to accept the divine healing power of our Lord. And the next thing you know, you're fine. We have to be careful about accepting these illnesses. I've told several of you the story of Leonard Tayfever, how when we first came to camp, some of you know Tony Brayton, who was about six foot four, and he and Leonard, who's not quite that tall, <laughs> used to carry tables from the barn over to the book room. And you know, Tony would be striding along like this, and Leonard would be coming along like this, and Tony would look back and say, come on. And Leonard said, I have hay fever. And Tony said, don't cherish it. And he kept right on going. And Leonard has not had one bit of hay fever since that time. A little later on, we were traveling with Dave Jenks, who was the chairman of the CFO. We were going out to one of the national meetings, and he was sneezing and sniffling. And we told him that story, and he said he went up to his room that night, and he said, well, if Leonard could get over his hay fever by not cherishing it, I'm not going to cherish mine either. And he came down the next morning, and he was free of his hay fever. But this is subtle. You have to believe it. And we have a man in our church that we've been trying to get to, to accept this for four years. And he says, I have it. I've always had it. Come the first of May, I know I'll have it. And we keep saying, don't say that. Don't say you're going to have it. And a strange thing happened this year. He didn't say it. And we noticed that he wasn't really sniffling quite as much. We didn't dare mention it, because we knew if we'd mentioned it, he'd say, oh, yes, I have it. <laughs> One of the first requirements of accepting the healing, the health that God has for us, is to see the wholeness, not to see the symptoms, not to let anybody tell you that there's something wrong, but rather see the picture of your perfect wholeness, the way God sees you, and the way Jesus sees you. And when we turn to him in faith, believing, that's really what faith is. It's believing. It's not saying, oh, yes, I think it's right. It's really knowing deep down within that it is the truth, that we really do believe what is said. Somebody called me not long ago, and she said, somebody in your church told me that you could help me. She said, I've had the flu for several weeks, and I can't seem to get any better. So I talked to her a little bit and told her what I believed about, I asked her if she believed in God. Oh, yes, she, she was a good Catholic. She believed in God. And did she believe that God could heal her? Yes, she believed. And so we talked a little bit more about accepting this healing power, which was within her. So finally she got through and she said, oh, I see, it's positive thinking. It is not positive thinking. Don't ever get that into your mind. You can never heal yourself by saying, I'm not sick, I'm not sick, I'm not sick. There is a spiritual power within us which becomes released when we tie it into our belief in the Christ. And that is where the healing power is. And this is why so many people who try to deny any kind of illness they have are just as ill. They don't get any better because they do not recognize that it is not a positive thought that's going to make them well. It's the divine power of the Christ within them which is going to manifest itself. And therefore, this is what Jesus meant when he said, do you believe that I can do this? Meaning, do you think I have that kind of power? Do you think there is that healing power available to you? That was what he was asking them, not if they would say, yes, I'm a positive thinker. And so that is one of the first requirements that we have in order to have that kind of health that God intends for every one of us to have. So many times we get the idea that God is punishing us. Oh, why am I suffering this way? What have I done? Oh, what sins I must have committed that this should happen to me. And it has nothing to do with God and your sins. It has to do with our ability to accept that spiritual power which is available to us. 
And we are the victims of our society, the victims of the consciousness, the ideas that are constantly projected at us. And these things do come to us. I had somebody come to church one Sunday. She was brought by a friend. And I happened to be preaching on healing, which she wasn't aware of. And I did not know that she was scheduled for surgery the next day. So I spoke about healing and about how we needed to accept this power of God within us. And when the service was over, the friend who brought her was very angry. And she said, Margaret, you just laid a guilt trip on my friend. And I said, what do you mean? Well, she's supposed to have surgery tomorrow, and now she believes that just because she doesn't have enough faith, that's just why she has to have that surgery. And I said, you didn't listen to what I was saying. Oh, yes, we did. We heard you say that because she didn't believe, this was why she had to have this operation. I hope you're hearing what I'm saying. There is a divine spiritual power available to us. And we have to learn how to allow it to manifest itself in our bodies. We are not to tell God just exactly how he's going to do it. We are simply to see the picture that God sees. Be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Some people get confused with that. I'm not a Greek student, and I don't know why they translated it be. But I think maybe they meant the, the way some people colloquially say, I be so-and-so, meaning I am. And I think that this is what God, uh, that verse means, that I am perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. Spiritually, I'm perfect. And to get it manifested in the body is the next step. I don't know whether any of you read the recent guidepost. There was a very fascinating uh, account uh, of a woman who had uh, breast cancer. And it tells in great detail about how she went through the traditional treatments and so on, but she was not going to accept this breast cancer, so she started running, and, and I don't want to go into all the detail of the story, but she ended up by saying, I never had breast cancer. I had cancer of the person, and I have no cancer now. And she told about how she managed to discover what it was that had brought about this manifestation in her body. Things manifest in her, on our bodies which are in our spirits. And so many times we say, oh, how could that happen to that wonderful person, that good person? You don't know anything about anybody else. All you know is about yourself. What kind of thinking you have, what kind of belief you have, what kind of relationship you have to this spirit which is within each one of us. And the literature, the spiritual literature, is so full of so many illustrations of the wonderful way in which God works in our lives and in our bodies, that if we can concentrate on those things, that is the way by which we can release this healing power. I suppose some of you uh, remember the story of that darn cat. It was written by a team of writers, Millie and Gordon Gordon. And they used to write the books, and then they used to go out on speaking tours and talk about them, and that's the way, you know, you publicize your books. You go out and, and talk about them. And one year, she began to be very weak and tired, and she finally went to the doctor, and the doctor said that she had a very severe heart condition, and so they put her in the hospital and took care of her for several months, and then they finally released her, but she didn't seem to get any better. So she went back again, and they discovered that she had a cancer of the spine. And the doctor said, there's nothing we can do for you. Just go home and be as comfortable as you can. But they were members of a prayer group, and they had very strong belief in the power of God. So they went home, and they asked their prayer group to start to pray for them. And she had a, a bed upstairs where she could look out and see the beauties of nature. And every morning, her husband brought her breakfast, and he said, this is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And they would talk about their book. She, she couldn't write anymore, but she could talk about it. And she could listen to the scripture that he would read to her. And they would talk about God and, and the scriptures that reveal the healing power, plus the scriptures that help them to understand what the real goal of life was. And one morning she discovered that she could sit up 
was the first time she'd been able to sit up for several weeks. The next thing you knew, she was putting her feet over the side of the bed. And then she got out of bed and took enough steps to the top of the stairs and sat on the top of the stairs while they opened up their morning mail. And gradually, she got stronger and stronger. And once more, they became a speaking team. And she said she felt that her ministry now was to share with her audiences what had happened to her. They never thought about the illness. They concentrated on the power of God and upon the scripture and the promises that Jesus had given to us in that scripture. So to hold your eyes upon the power, the healing power of God, is really the way by which we can experience the healing that God has for every single one of us. I want you to be sure to understand that I am not saying we should not use doctors. Doctors are God's gift to us. I don't want somebody to come up to me and say, hey, you sound like a Christian scientist, which is what I always get every time I talk about healing. I'm not a Christian scientist. I'm a Christian. And this is the application of Jesus' teaching as I understand it. And so we do use doctors. Doctors are God's gift. God has revealed these wonderful things through doctors, and I think we should use them. But just think of what has happened to our society and just in the last few years when we used to have those terrible scourges of, of uh, infantile paralysis and diphtheria and pneumonia and things which were just uh, a death sentence, really, when uh, before we discovered vaccines and all of those things that... Uh, doctors have been able to discover and use. And I think that using the medications, using the doctor's wisdom, helps us, helps us to accept this healing power. And if we have medicine to use, we should bless it, and we should thank God for it, and we should ask the Spirit to use it in whatever way is necessary in order to bring about the wholeness in our bodies which God wants each one of us to have. And so... Do not be disturbed over the fact that I am talking about the healing power of the Christ because that is one way by which that healing power is amplified in our society today. And you know that if there are people who have special healing power, they can perform miraculous healings just the way Catherine Pullman did. But it, it was a small percentage of the people that were healed by her. It was those who had absolute belief in her power. And many times in the, in the scripture we find that people could get to Jesus, they could only get to him, that would be all that they would need. They were sure that they would be healed. And then he always said to them, go and sin no more. Now if somebody tells you you're a sinner, that's why you're sick, you won't like that very much. None of us do. But I think what he meant by sinning was failing to recognize who they are and what the power is within. Every single one of us is a spiritual child of God. That's the only identification we should have. There was a psychologist one time, and he asked his class to go out and do a survey and ask people the question, who, am, who are you? And people would say, oh, I'm, I'm Leonard's wife, or uh, I'm a teacher, or I'm a secretary, or I'm the mother of a few children. And when they brought the results back, he said he was absolutely astounded that nobody said, I am a child of God. We are divine spiritual beings. That's all we are divine spiritual beings living at the present time in a human body. And the human body takes on the characteristics that we give it. And sometimes we have to work hard to find out how to release all of those qualities that might be preventing us from living in accordance with God's perfect picture of us. But when we do what glorious witnesses we are, when somebody has had an illness and becomes well through spiritual health, 
how wonderful it is, because that's what we're here for, to be God's witnesses. And we glorify God when we are able to manifest a perfectly whole body. And I'm sure that every one of you who's been living in the spiritual consciousness finds that your health is far better than it ever used to be. That you have more energy, you have a greater sense of exuberance, you have a joy in living, and you have a belief in what your purpose is here in this world. I better be careful or I'll get into creative visualization. But <laughs> it is a picture that comes to us. And we look back and see, I, I can look back over my life when I was sick half the time. A lot of us were brought up by parents who felt we weren't supposed to be well. If you had a little cold, you were promptly put to bed and stayed there for a week. And we accepted this kind of a, of a poor health picture. There's one woman in our church who almost cries every time I say anything like this because she says, I brought my children up to be sick. They had all kinds of illnesses because I put it on them. I saw little symptoms and I said, oh, you've got this, you've got that. And there are all kinds of things that uh, happened to them. And she said, it, it was my fault. I didn't know any better, but it was my fault. So probably a lot of us were brought up that way. And there is an explanation. We shouldn't blame our parents because it was before the time of vaccines and before the time of medicine, which could really take care of so many of these germ illnesses and infections that come around. But once we understood that there is this power available to us and align ourselves with it, which is within us, we don't have to go anywhere to get it. We don't have to beg God for it. It is there to be received. And this is another great requirement of this kind of healing, to accept it and expect it. In fact, it's necessary in every kind of a spiritual experience. We must accept it. Jesus said, people asked him to give them a sign. He said, no sign will be given. Believe first, and then the results will show. Often people say, well, if God would just heal me, then I'd really follow him. I'd be a good Christian. But that isn't the way it works. We have to accept this divine power within us, that we are divine beings. And as we understand this, as we allow it to take over our lives and be manifested in our bodies, then we are able to have this kind of help which God has planned for every single one of us. <coughs> we need to fill our minds, too, with experiences that people have had. I've told you some few stories. But... The more we share experiences or the knowledge of experiences of other people, the more it strengthens our own faith. And we say, well, if it could happen to them, it can happen to me. And so we begin to see what their applications were of the scripture and how they were able to gain the kind of faith that they wanted to in order to have it manifested in their bodies. And this is another way by which we really can experience the divine healing power of the Christ. Children are wonderful channels for God's healing power. They have no limitations. When we talk about praying for somebody, oh yes, I can pray with perfect confidence that this person will be well. But the picture of the illness is in our minds, and we really have to work in order to see a wholeness and a healing. But a child just takes the faith that people tell them about and act on it. A little boy had a very serious ear condition. And finally, he was told that if he would just ask God to heal him, God would. And he said, please, God, heal me and do it now. And he did. This is how Agnes Stanford got her first experience of healing. Her little son was very ill with uh, ear infection, and the priest came, the, the minister came to uh, to call and found out that the little boy was sick, and he said, uh, I'll just go up and say a prayer for him. And I can hear Agnes now because she was one of these very down-to-earth people, you know, there was no nonsense about her, and she said, oh, I've already prayed for him and nothing has happened. I don't see that that will do any good. Oh, well, he said, I'll just go up anyway. And she said he put his hands on the little boy's ears, and he just said, Lord, pour your healing power through John and make him well. And thank you. And he went. And Agnes said about a half an hour later, 
The fever was absolutely gone, and in another day, the little boy was well. The priest has the belief that there was a healing power available. Agnes didn't. And it's very hard for us to pray for somebody very close to us when we know all of the symptoms and we've taken care of them and we realize how they've been suffering and so on. And we feel we've prayed for them, we've loved them, we've tried to do everything we can in order to bring about that, that healing, but it just hasn't resulted. But somebody else who doesn't know them very well can be a contact for that healing power. Another little boy at the time of the polio epidemic was standing beside his sister who was being taken to the hospital. And he just knelt down beside her and said, please, God, make her well. And they took her to the hospital, and when they got there, there was no sign of the polio at all. To believe so simply and sincerely is just the way to open that channel. And, of course, children can do it because they don't know all of the ways by which uh, we, all the experiences we've had of the kind of uh, difficulties of physical healing that happen. Another thing that causes a difficulty in, in maintaining healing is a sense of guilt. Many people feel they have to be punished. The late Bishop Pike told a story one time. I heard him tell this. He was asked by a doctor to go and see a man who was in the hospital. He said, I can do nothing for him. I've done all I can do for him. And I think perhaps if he saw a priest, it would help. So Bishop Pike went to see him. The man was very ill. He didn't really expect he was going to live. He sat beside him, and all of a sudden the Lord said to him um, to say to the man, Is there anything on your mind? And the man said, Yes, there is. I have done a terrible thing, and there's no way I can make any restitution for it. And he told the bishop his story. And the bishop said there was no way he could make any restitution. He said, are you willing to ask God's forgiveness for it? Oh, yes, he was, and he would. He said, all right, ask God to forgive you, tell him you're sorry, and that you would like his forgiveness. And then he said, as a priest of the church, I am ordained to give you the sacrament of absolution. And he said, I will pray that you will feel the relief from the sense of guilt, and, and God will give you complete forgiveness. And he left. The next morning, the doctor called, and he said, What did you do to that man? And Bishop Pike said, What did I do? What do you mean? He said, I discharged him this morning perfectly well. Guilt as it takes a terrible toll of our body, and sometimes we don't realize it. We bury it deep down, and we just pay no attention to it. But it breaks out in all kinds of different ways. And so it is important, if we're having trouble, if we're having difficulty in feeling well and being able to function in the way in which we would like to, to sit down and ask the Lord if there's anything that is deep down within your consciousness that you need to be healed of. They call this the healing of the memories, and I'm sure many of you have heard of it. There's a very specific technique for it. It's better if you can work with somebody who, who's skilled in it and who who is able to help you pray, but you could do it alone. And the Sanford's method used to be to divide your life into ten periods and take a week and take a pencil and paper and just sit down and ask the Lord if there's anything that you need to have brought up into your conscious mind that could be could need forgiveness and healing. And then she would say, I was in one of her classes where it went for five weeks, and so we divided it up into five periods. And then each time we would come, she would say, now we will take all those things that are on your paper, and we will pray that the Lord will give you complete absolution from them. And then she would pray for the memories that we don't know, we aren't aware of, that are deep down in there. And then gradually she would take us back to the time when this when we were babies and even before we were born, because sometimes there are traumas that occur to us even before we're born. And so many healings took place as a result of that. I did that in one of my prayer groups, and one girl kept coming in saying, I didn't think that was bothering me. I never thought that was bothering me. I thought that was all gone by. She found so many different things that kept coming up 
into her conscious mind that she didn't think were having any influence on her at all. And so there are many different things that are preventing us from allowing that divine power within us to take over and fulfill its perfect role. And my best way of, of uh, receiving this healing power is to just see it flowing through my body like a light. Lots of times before I go to sleep, I see this light of God starting up with my toes and just let it flow all the way up through my body and out through the top of my head. And then I ask God to just take that and let that spirit of his commune with my spirit throughout the night. You know, that's another way, a preventive way, really, of having trouble. Before you go to sleep, ask God to take your spirit and commune with it. You know, we, our, our subconscious minds don't sleep, and God never sleeps, of course. And so it can commune with your spirit and bring about whatever kind of healing is necessary or whatever kind of information we need to have if we consciously make that contact with that divine spirit. So there are many different techniques that we can use and learn about in order to experience that wholeness. And then see yourself well. Stand in front of your mirror every morning and say, I'm a beautiful, healthful person. Sometimes you think, oh, that's just plain pride. You know, can't do that. Can't ex exercise that kind of egotism. That is an egotism. That's appreciating the spirit which is within us. Just do it. Just stand in front of your mirror and say, you are a divine spiritual being. You're beautiful. God sees you beautiful. And his spirit is really going to sustain you during this day and make you even more beautiful and more successful. We need to appreciate ourselves. Too many times we deny any of our qualities. We criticize ourselves. We're much more likely to criticize ourselves than we are to appreciate ourselves. And when we know that we are divine spiritual beings, beings then we have a right to accept that divine power in all its glory and all its manifestations. Somebody will say to you, hey, what's happened to you? You're so much, you look so much more beautiful today. Something has happened. Your whole expression has changed. You look so much more vibrant, so much freer, so much uh, happier, and so on. It's going to manifest in your appearance. So these are some of the techniques that I, I found that are helpful to me and, and that have been helpful to people who, that I have ministered to. Tomorrow, we are going to have a healing service here. I'm going to sound very hard-hearted about it. If you need healing, we want you to do some soul searching before you come. The first thing we want you to do is to believe it's possible. No use coming if you're just going to come and try it out. See if God can do anything. If that really doesn't work. Jesus said, do you believe that I can do this? We have to believe that the healing power of God is available and we can receive it. Now, we're not going to tell you that there's going to be a miracle right tomorrow, but we are telling you that if you can come with faith, believing that God's power is available to you, the healing will begin. And then we want you to come with that expectation, and we will lay hands on you. I guess that's the best way, Joe. Lay hands on you. And just ask the Lord to use us as his contact. We won't have any prolonged uh, invocations because, or intercessions because we don't have to tell God. All we have to do is offer him up. Jesus never said, well, now let's see. Um, what is it you're suffering from? How long have you had it? What does the doctor tell you about it? Uh, maybe something can happen and maybe not. Jesus said, go and sin no more which really meant go and believe in the power of God within you. That's all that's required, is to believe that there is that divine spirit within you which is waiting to meet every need you have. And that's the attitude with which we want you to come to the healing service. And then in the evening, we're going to have a communion service, and that is going to put the seal on the healing 
When you come to a communion service, if you come in the spirit in which Jesus told us that we should receive it, he said, this is my body and this is my blood, which is for your healing. And this is a healing sacrament. And when we take it in that expectation, we will receive the kind of healing that God has. Was a man who, a man in a congregation who was was in an automobile accident and he was in a coma, and his wife was with him in the hospital, and the minister said to the congregation, "We will take this sacrament on his behalf." And so the congregation all saw, as they took the bread and the wine, that the spirit of God was relieving, was healing this man. And his wife said, at that very moment, when the congregation was receiving the sacrament on his behalf, the man opened his eyes and came out of the coma. And from then on, the healing was very quick and complete. We have these things which help us to make contact with that spirit which is within us. We're such material beings that it's hard for us to think in those spiritual terms. So sacraments and any other means by which we can focus our spirit on that spirit within are all very helpful. It's like the, putting a whole lot of electrical wires together. They become a real cable which will take the power and, and carry it in the direction in which it's supposed to go. So those two things tomorrow will be a healing power for you. You may not want to get well. You know, it's very convenient sometimes not to have to be well. You don't have to do anything. Uh, everybody's sympathetic with you. You may have gotten a lot of love when you were little, when you were sick, and so, well, why not? I can get all this attention. I don't have to do anything. Search your heart and see what it is down there that might you might not want to give up. No use of coming if you have this kind of feeling. As I say, I sound very harsh, but we want it to be a service of power, and we don't want you to short circuit that power unknowingly. So this is why I'm suggesting to you the things that you should do tonight if you want to come for healing of any kind, a little healing or a healing of the spirit, a healing of the body, a healing of the mind, whatever kind of healing that you need and want. See if you can identify with one of those stories that we told, we read tonight in the scripture. And have that kind of faith that whatever God promised, God is faithful to perform. And if you can get yourself into that state of belief that you will accept the healing and really believe in your divine power within you, then we invite you to come. And we want to see you all perfectly whole and well. And that's one of the purposes that we're here this week, to learn how to let the spiritual power within us in so many different ways take us on that journey, which the goal of which is to develop our souls to the point where we really can be in touch with the divine mind, the divine spirit of God. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, we do thank you for being willing to come and demonstrate to us the way God meant for us to live. So many times throughout the Bible, God has tried to tell us what he's put to us for us. From the time of our creation, when he created us in his image, to live in the Garden of Eden, a perfect whole life. And then we decided we didn't want to do that. So throughout the years, we have suffered. We decided what we thought was good. We decided what we thought was evil. And then Jesus came to show us exactly how he wanted us to live. And he gave us a specific pattern. But he condensed it into only two sentences. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And we know that when we can have that kind of love for you, 
for our neighbors and for ourselves, that we've opened up the way by which your spirit can flow out in the way in which you planned it when you created us. And so we do thank you, and we bless you, and we ask that you will make your presence very real to us throughout this night, witness to every one of our spirits, giving us wisdom and understanding and guidance in order that we can go farther out, as Glenn Clark said, and experience the joy of being with you in that spiritual kingdom. And so we bless you and we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Do we do the prayer for the world? Do we do the prayer for the world? Thy kingdom come, O Lord. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let there be peace on earth, and let us begin with me. 